Welcome again to the Explaining History podcast, and I'm delighted today to be joined by David Slattery Christie. Um, David's a writer, a, an advisor on the Robert Altman film Gosford Park, which if you haven't seen it, um, what are you even doing listening to this? It's one of the, <laughs> it's sort of kind of one of the, one of the, the, the best, I say, Hollywood films made about Britain that I, I think is, you know, in, in the last sort of 20 or 30, 30 or 40 years even. Um, and to, today we, we, we have got a fascinating conversation um, uh, about the kind of the, not so much the rise and fall, just the fall of um, a, a British aristocrat, Harry Clifton. Um, and it kind of mirrors, really, it's a story that sort of mirrors many of the, the, the fortunes of the British aristocracy in, in, in the 20th century. Um, but anyway, to begin, firstly, David, welcome, and thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you. It's it's great to be here and to meet you. Lovely. So, firstly, um, let's start by just talking a bit about who Harry Clifton was, um, and um, and also there's there's a bit of, there's a part of Eve Evelyn War is kind of involved in the story, isn't it? He kind of comes into the story a bit later um, in the twenties, but Harry Clifton was um, well it, to give him his correct name. It was Henry Talbot de Vere Clifton, but he was known as Harry to everybody, and he was the firstborn son to John Talbot Clifton and Violet Clifton, um, who were the, um, uh, he was the squire of the Clifton dynasty at the time. Harry was born in 1907. Um, so he was born into a family uh, that for hundreds of years were one of the largest landowners in the UK. Mm. So they were quite a significant family, really. And Harry's mother have, was directly descended to Charles II as well. So yeah. there was a bit of royal blood in there um, uh, too. But Harry's father was a very uh, typical sort of tough Victorian adventurer. And interestingly, considering the kind of errant way that Harry went um, from being a young man, his father had actually been quite a, a kind of um, a gambler, a drinker when he was a young man and caused a bit of concern. Um, but he even had an affair with Lily Langtry, who oh, was right. the famous sort of who'd become infamous because she'd been the mistress of uh, the Prince of Wales who became Edward VII. Um, but Harry's father was also uh, friends with uh, uh, the Tsar and his family. Mm. And the Grand Duke Michael actually visited Lytham Hall, which is the family seat in Lancashire, um, uh, in 1908. So there was they had quite grand connections, the family, really, in lots of ways. But I think Harry was brought up because he was the first son. His father was quite hard on him, really. Right. Because where Harry wanted to be more sort of bookish and academic and had aspirations to be a poet and writer, um, his father kind of um, was quite strict and not very nice with him because he felt that he needed to focus on more practical things because he was going to take over the estates and the management of all the land. And uh, they had estates in Ireland, which they had to give up um, after the First World War. But mm -hmm. the, his father bought another big estate in on Islay, uh, mm. up in Scotland as well. So, there, you know, it, his father's attitude was, you're, you're responsible for all these estates and all the people who work on them. So yeah. you need to get your head out of the clouds and man up a bit, really. And unfortunately, Harry didn't react well to that yeah. and went the other way in many ways. I was reading a thing recently. It was in the 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 biography of um, the autobiography of Felix Dennis, who is the kind of the hippie publisher millionaire uh, right. sort of um, kind of maniac, really. And he, he he made some points about inherited wealth, and he said, "Well, you know, the kind of the the somebody like the Duke of Westminster, their job, if you can describe it as that, is to safeguard." the uh the dynastic wealth against one profligate generation that will inevitably mm. prop up and um you know it, it's, it's interesting when you think about i mean if you, if you think about kind of 
social class and and sort of how that's kind of economically formed in in, in various ways. Mm. In this case, you know, Harry Clifton was being told, look, listen, you're whatever you think your future is, your your mm. job, your duty is to safeguard the, the family's wealth because you know, gener- you know that that can go, that can be swept away. It's it's kind of all about the next generation, isn't it? Really, yeah. For these people, it's yeah. it's kind of their life is almost irrelevant. That their job is to preserve everything. For yeah. the next generation to come, which is yeah. uh, is kind of quite a heavy burden, I would but, imagine. <laughs> well, it, well, it is, and it's if, if you look at sort of you know the, the fragmentation of social class in the, in the sort of in the twentieth century, you have people that were born the sons of miners who say, "Well, I'm not going down the pit. I want to mm. go and do something else." And they, they was, people mm. become working class intellectuals and want to be a writer, yeah. or a poet, or a painter. Um, and and I suppose when you when you look at the story of Harry Clifton as we will, he's, he, there seems to be this kind of rebellion almost against the, the burdens placed on him. Sure, yeah. I, I, the, the, it's interesting because it, uh, having gone through sort of like uh, sort of a, a two or three years now of looking into this man's life, and it's interesting when I first one of the first times I ever visited Lytham Hall because. Now Lytham Hall's open to the public for the first time ever, literally in the last few years. A lot of the Clifton history is now coming to life again. And I remember going and one of the guides at the hall um, sort of said, uh, and of course that awful Harry Clifton. And immediately my ears pricked up because I thought that's quite a kind of, sweeping generalization why was this man considered so awful so of course that fascinated me because Mm. i do i'm a bit i'm kind of drawn to people who are a bit forgotten and maybe people who are a bit black sheep or not quite didn't fit into the norm of what was expected of them Mm. so that fascinated me um, and the more I look, the more i looked into his life and the more i thought there must be more to this man than just being that awful Harry Clifton. Mm. There must be more to this. So that's kind of what made me start sort of digging deeper, really. Yeah. Um, to discover, you know, what why he did what he did. Because yeah. there is a part of me now at this end of my journey that I do wonder whether there was a part of Harry that made the decision to do what he did and be so destructive because he never wanted anyone to go through what he had to go through and the expectations that were kind of heaped upon him, really, yeah, that he rebelled against. I mean, I notice. I mean, in my, my day job is in is actually mental health and mm. um, there are all sorts of ways that people um, people kind of respond when they, they're seemingly given no choice. And one of them is, is what they call in transactional analysis, I'll show you. Um, mm. And it's kind of that uh, you, you've told me I have no choice. Well, let's just see about that. Um, mm. And I wonder if there's an element of that. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, well, th- there was an interesting, some interesting letters, a couple of letters that, um, and I've included some extracts in the book that Harry Clifton wrote to the estate manager and the estate manager, William, who um, he seemed to have a more, um, mentor type relationship with Harry than his own father did and Harry wrote to William and before his father had died and because he did have a younger brother Michael uh, Harry and kind of in this letter said look I don't think I'm cut out for this I don't think it's right that can you do something to I've tried to speak to my father and say I don't want to inherit let it go to Michael he's more suited And, of course, his father dismissed him. But in this letter to William, the estate manager, Harry is saying, can you not speak to my father and try and make this happen? Mm. He said it's to do with it would make death duties worse, but there must be a way around this. Michael would be better at it than me. Um, But, of course, they never did, and uh, he was refused. And maybe had that happened maybe things would have turned out differently. But interesting you talk about the mental health side because 
um, there was a point in the 1930s where Harry's mother, had, on a couple of occasions, tried to get him certified as insane mm. because of, you know, the way he was squandering money, the way he was selling everything off to and, and doing sort of very strange, eccentric things. Um, and in a way, Harry was the Aristotle aristocratic eccentrics eccentric yeah he, he yeah. was even eccentric in their terms do you know what i mean so but yeah so it's you know and harry was he also had like um mentors and guides he was interested in spiritualism and for instance every week he had a permanent suite at the ritz after he inherited and he had uh, an advisor called the White Goddess. And once a week in the restaurant at the Ritz, Harry would dine with her and spend the the whole evening talking to her and chatting to her. And, of course, the staff at the Ritz in the restaurant, they served her and spoke to her and pulled the chair out for her to sit down. But actually, nobody could see her but Harry. Yes. So she, he's, um, you know... Uh, this, this is either kind of eccentricity or perhaps sort of yeah. uh, psychosis or something. But yeah, but so, maybe it was it was somebody who would listen to him. Yeah, where in his own family nobody would, you know. And it, it's yeah, I think there's something very poignant and quite sad about that. I feel. Yeah. Well, well, there there is, and you know, if you look in the the various kind of annals of kind of. Um, what you, you call abnormal psychology or kind of uh, uh there there is and countless examples of people do of creating those sorts of imaginary circumstances for themselves mm -hmm. um and so so essentially the um the the, the fortune the, the the family fortune uh and under harry is is squandered mm -hmm. um and you mentioned spiritualism he was part of a, a what you would call a cult is that right well, yes, he, he eventually he kind of um, uh, went to when he went to America. He met another sort of woman who was known as the Ghost of Hollywood, and he gave her thousands and thousands of pounds to build a temple. And I think it was the the Agabeg Occult Temple. It was about forty thousand pound he gave her, um, but she turned out interestingly to be a con woman. Yeah. Um, because she was involved with um, uh, Lou Bryce, who was the famous comedian Fanny Bryce's brother, and they nearly stung him out of another £40,000 over a poker game, but it turned out to be an illegal form of poker. Right. So, um, But he seemed to do this... The, he, he, he seemed to do all this with a very blasé attitude, there was, I think it was Brian Desmond Hurst who invested, Harry invested money in to make a Edgar Allan Poe film, The Beating Heart, uh, from that uh, particular um, story. Um, and um, when he was sort of having lunch with Harry at the Ritz one day, um, this he saw Harry talking to this young guy, and and, and afterwards he said, "You do realise, you know, how do you know him?" And he said, well, you know, I've invested in a couple of projects. He said, well, you do know he's a con man, don't you, and a, and a fraud. And Harry said, oh, yes, of course, darling, but everybody deserves a second chance. So it's like he almost did it knowingly. Yeah. And, and you know, that's, you know, you know, who knows? No, none of us knows what was going on in his mind, but it certainly wasn't normal, rational behaviour, was it? Really? No. And I think um, there's. I, I noticed in, uh, in in part of the story we mentioned that um, the the novelist he probably wasn't quite a novelist at the time when he knew him, but the, uh, but the, the the future novelist Evelyn Waugh um, mm. had been <clears throat> friends with uh, Harry Clifton, hadn't he? Mm. Well, it seems that when because um, Harry had gone to uh, Downside School in Somerset, which was very sporty. And it was run by Benedictine monks. And he was quite miserable there because he hated sport. But again, it was his father's way of trying to sort of make him a man, if that's, yeah. you know. Um, but uh, when he left there, his father got him a place at uh, Oxford. 
um, and Harry went along with it. But uh, uh, when I did a bit of research, because nobody knew um, wh where he'd gone, which college he'd gone to in Oxford. So I did a bit of research with a, uh, I have a, a friend who's a research fellow in Oxford, so they did a bit of digging for me and discovered that he matriculated at Christchurch um, and uh, had rooms at Christchurch. Now, this was in the sort of like mid-1920s, and Evelyn Waugh had been at Oxford just earlier than Harry um, because he'd set up with um, uh, one or two friends and Alistair Graham as well, uh, the Notorious Hypocrites Club, which okay. was basically um, a, a club, a private drinking club where... Um, uh, homosexual men could go, lesbians could go, uh, transvestites could go. Uh, anybody who was sort of interested in sexual fluidity, there was orgies apparently. It was quite mm. notorious. In fact, it was so bad in the end that the uh, university had it closed down by 1929. Um, now, Evelyn Waugh had a feud with his tutor who wouldn't let him graduate. So he kind of haunted Oxford a bit longer in the hope that his, his tutor would relent. And uh, they said that he hadn't done enough weeks in his in one year to graduate. Um, so he, he kind of hung about in the hope they would allow him to do that, but they never did, obviously. Um, and in, in 1928, Harry's father um, died suddenly. So Harry inherited in 1928. So... The other thing they have in common is they were both sent down from Oxford without degrees, right? Which is a bit of a tragedy in itself, really, you know. Um, but Evelyn War always said that you know um, they'll remember me long after they've forgotten any of my tutors, and I suppose that turned out to be right, really. Yeah. Now, for me, it's kind of inconceivable to imagine that somebody like Harry at Oxford. Because he loved being at Oxford and he loved all this kind of hedonism, that it it seems fairly sure that they met at Oxford. That's where they first met or encountered each other. And Harry, being like he is, was kind of you know he was news really, and he was you know a, a lot of the sort of titled families knew about him and knew about his eccentricities. So, um, so yeah, so that was really where things developed. Now. When I discovered that Harry had rooms at Christchurch, of course, this is where we first meet Sebastian Flight. Yes. In Brideshead, who's also very eccentric and has very odd sort of ideas about life, etc. Um, and then we, like, there's uh, Evelyn Waugh visited Lytham Hall in the 30s. Mm -hmm. um, and at one occasion, he wrote to Lady Asquith to tell her that all the Cliftons were tearing mad uh, because obviously he met. Uh, Harry's mother and his sister Daffodil um, uh, during, you know, these visits in the 30s. So, um, and it was very interesting to then discover that apparently Violet Clifton, Harry's mother, in 1945, when Brideshead was published, was absolutely furious with Evelyn War and never spoke to him again because she was convinced that he'd based Sebastian Flight on Harry. Yes. And she also recognised bits of herself in Lady Marchmain as well. And, so, and Lytham Hall would have, would, was Brideshead, I presume. Well, I mean, he went there, but I mean, in the end, he used uh, Castle Howard, didn't he, which was in yes. Yorkshire. But then Castle Howard's much... Gra I mean, don't get me wrong, Lytham Hall is a beautiful Georgian house, um, and it is very grand in its own way. Um, but I can see why he went... Castle Howard because it sort of has something extra really yeah but there's no doubt Evelyn Moore visited Lytham Hall um, he knew the Cliftons um, he had an opinion about them so yeah. the more you look at Harry and his eccentricities you can kind of start to understand why his mother would think what she thought so mm. yeah which it's made it all more intriguing for me really yeah I think it's because you you obviously been the adv an advisor in, in, in regarding Ivan Novello mm. on um, Gosford uh, Park, on Gosford yeah. Park. And, of course, and this is Ivan Novello, of... yeah, was the only factual character in Gosford Park. Yes, yes, and I think that, that it was really interesting choice to 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 put um, that character in the film, and mm. and I think it was 
it was saying again i think it was saying something about the where the kind of the aristocracy was after the first world war mm. and you have this you have this this new the relatively new thing of you know um, basically a working class person who becomes famous and, and wealthy based on uh, on, on talent and new, and the sort of the new media of the time mm. and and I, I guess if if you and slightly looked down upon as well you know well, yes um, by by the you know of course we'll oh yes you you write music and and you you act in plays but of course we'll never see them because we'll never go to that. You know, it's and with Evelyn War, it was the same. It was, you know, uh, the, a lot of the uh, aristocracy at the time, the, their attitude was that he wrote cheap novels. And of course, I'll never read them, darling, because I don't read things like that. So it's yeah, yeah no, it's in it. But Robert Altman, interestingly, was a great had always been a great fan of Novello and his music. Yeah. And had always wanted to use him in um, in a film. Um and you know he 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 wanted um, the character of Novello to be brought alive because it gave you also in the film it gave you that alternate dynamic between the nouveau riche, yeah, and the you know established aristocracy, and it kind of highlighted the snobbery really, yeah, between the two, yeah. And for for anybody that um, lives in in my hometown here, Cardiff, if you want to know where, or go and see where Ivan Novello grew up, you can um, walk down through Canton, and I think there's a blue plaque on the wall there. And the place where you're walking really is the beginnings of the, the almost the, the beginnings of the the Victorian kind of docklands. Yeah. So he was Ivor Davis was proper proper Cardiff working class. Um, and um, there is a there is a pub in Canton called the Ivor Davis um, in his honour. Um, so right. that gives you a, a sense <clears throat> of. There's a statue there as well. Is it outside the New Millennium Theatre? Yeah, I think so. Yes. There. Yeah, there's a statue as well. Yeah. The um, I I think with the story of of Harry Clifton, obviously, you know, he mm. he he went out to Hollywood and backed some poorly thought through film projects. <laughs> But there, yeah. there you've got this kind of interaction between this old old money, which mm. you know, born of land ownership more than anything else, and has been in the family yeah. since probably the Middle Ages, mm. that feels very shaky and vulnerable in in the twentieth century. Um, having these interactions with these these sorts of new forms of generating wealth and you know mass entertainment yeah. and, and that mm. kind of thing and. You're, you're in an I think, uh, yeah, I think also for, for Harry Clifton, uh, like as for Evelyn War, I think the generation that were young after the First World War, kind of, they kind of made the decision they didn't want to continue what had always been. Yeah, they wanted to make the world in their own image. Yeah, you know, they, you know, they didn't want to have to conform to those kind of Victorian Edwardian ideals anymore and they kind of you know they rebelled against the system and against the establishment and yeah. you know a lot of these aristocratic families that they saw talking about money as as a bit sort of um, uh, a bit coarse a bit common really you didn't talk about things like that but people that came along in the 20s like Ivan Novello and Noel Coward and these people who became sort of very, very wealthy, influential people, they were seen as vulgar. Yeah. Um, but they were the new way. And, and you know, people like Harry, um, he was attracted because he thought the, the film medium was fascinating. Uh, unfortunately, he, you know, um, he lost a lot of money because he didn't mm. make very good decisions. Um, and, you know, going back to the mental health thing, he very much sort of deluded himself that he was this marvellous, wonderful businessman and all these people who flocked to get him to invest in their dodgy schemes were coming to him because they thought he was um, like a, a, this marvellous business guru that he just mm. wasn't, yeah? And 
maybe for him, by doing it, he enjoyed making other people happy by investing in their project and yeah. making their dreams come true, where yeah. his dreams had been crushed, really, by his family and the expectation that's put upon him. He strikes me so as there's, there's, a tr Yeah, there's a lot of interest in psychology with him, really. And I mean, even his marriage, really, which was very short and very strange. And it's said that actually um, that uh, Lillian was an American socialite and they they went on sort of like drinking benders. And one day when they woke up and sobered up, they realised they were married Um and it was a very volatile marriage. And, uh, of course, Harry did the Harry thing and ended up buying two Imperial Fabergé eggs on a whim at auction to sort of please this new wife he had. Um, but I'm sure those Fabergé eggs appealed to him because of his father's friendship with the Russian imperial family, which had been wiped out, you know. So, you know, there, there's always a link and a connection in what he did as to where his family had been at one point. He strikes me as a, have, having been a terrifically lonely person. Well, it's interesting, actually, because after once his marriage had collapsed after a couple of years, he married in 1937, they were divorced by 1941, and the rosebud egg, actually, uh, was sold at auction in New York in 1941 or two. So I'm kind of guessing that that was part of the divorce settlement that, you know, she got that and it was sold. But interestingly, it's the only one of the Fabergé eggs that have, have, has been damaged. And they think it was damaged when it was owned by somebody around the period where... Harry owned it with Lillian. So whether it got hurled across the room or not, <laughs> I don't know. But there you go. That's just an aside. But um, but after the First World War, but by the end of the 1930s, a lot of the land the family owned he'd sold off to, mm. to, 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 to liquidate it to get the money. Mm -hmm. By the end of the Second World War, he kind of drifted more and more into fantasy. Yeah. And... He always classed himself as a bachelor mm -hmm. of royal blood. Now, that bit was true, we know, through his mother's line. But he, his, his delusion seemed to... Um, he, he seemed to disappear further into them once yeah. the Second World War was over. Yeah. And they never spoke... Evelyn War and the Cliftons never spoke again after no. Brideshead was published. Yeah. And finally, in the end, you know, it's a very sad ending to the story, really, isn't there? He he sort of dies uh, in 1979, um, yep. penniless. Interesting. He, he outlived all his siblings, his younger brother, everybody. He outlived everybody, uh, Evelyn War, everybody. But by 1979, he wasn't exactly penniless, to be fair. He, he, I think he had less than £30,000. Right. Um, and... Lytham Hall had been um, uh, repossessed and with a deal because he had mortgages with Guardian Royal Exchange, the insurance company. Now, mm -hmm. they, they in a deal, they basically repossessed it, but they used it as their headquarters, which is why it was never open to the public until right. a few years ago. But anyway, um, he ended up living in Brighton in this kind of seedy Emerys hotel, uh, which was owned by um, a soothsayer, now, there's probably a good chance that she got the money to buy that from Harry, <laughs> I would I would say. Um, he had less than £30,000 left when he died, and in his lifetime, he went through the equivalent today of about £70 million. Pounds right. That was just squandered and blown away. Yeah. Right. Um, and it was very sad. A sad ending... Um, he, you know, he was alone, he had a heart attack, and yeah, um, it's I've, I've now that I know what I know about him, I can't, I couldn't imagine why anybody would call him the awful Harry Clifton. No. I think, in a way, he was quite brave because he he did what he wanted to do, he wanted to be just himself, and he did that. He, he managed to sort of blow and squander and destroy his family's heritage. But, 
you know, he, he, he kind of continued on his own path until the very end. Yeah. He, 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 I was just kind of imagining the, the Sid Vicious cover version of the song My Way there for a moment. The kind of, mm. um, yeah, yeah, no. So let's just talk about the book for a moment. We're good. We, we, okay. we finish. Um, okay. So um, tell us about the book and where people can uh, purchase it. Is it uh, is it currently available, or are we waiting? It is. Yeah, it, it was released officially on the sixteenth of November, so it's available now. Um, it's available any bookstores really. You can okay. you know you can get uh, Flight or Fancy, Evelyn War meets Harry Clifton on the Road to Brideshead. You can get it through Amazon all good bookstores i would recommend people go to their local bookstore yeah if you possibly can please because this is our message we must support local bookstores i yeah. was about yeah. to say this is the message at, ev at the end of every podcast yeah. support your local but thank you yeah. so much for, for for bringing that in yes please please look after your local bookstore because you'll miss it when it's gone yeah um and at the end of the day for 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 a piece of history it's a great story to just read even yes. if you've never heard of them, it's a great story and you can enjoy it for that. You know, if you want to know more about the Cliftons, you can find out beyond that book. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. you know, it, it's a stepping stone into a very, very fascinating period in our history. Um, yes. And uh, yeah, it's great. And bringing those people to life yeah. has been an absolute joy, really, because they don't make them like that anymore. No. That's for sure. Yeah. No, it's 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 a snap. Obviously, it's a snapshot of a world that, um, you know, less than a century ago was 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 with us. I mean, we still have mm. aristocrats, but not yeah. not not in the way that you know. I hadn't say in the nineteen. Well, they don't have the same power, do they? No, no. That they, you know, no. you've got the odd one or two still, like the Duke of Westminster and the Duke of Devonshire, but a lot of the small and minor aristocratic families of. Uh, well, they've become tourist attractions. Really. Yes. They've they've kind of had to become a tourist attraction, haven't they, to uh, to survive yeah. and keep going? Yeah. Swamped by the modern world. Well, there, yeah. there, there, we must finish, David. It's been an absolute okay. pleasure to talk to you, and and I do and hope that we well. can we can talk about dissolute aristocrats again sometime. Um, yeah, yeah. No, sure. Thank you so yeah, much. I have actually, there's uh, a few months ago, I I did. Uh, uh, publish a book because we've been talking about Ivan Novello and Gossard Park. Um, Ivan Novello did a, a biography of him, uh, an autobiography up to 1933. Um, that's as far as he went. They'd never been published before, but uh, um, I did include a, an unabridged version in a new version of uh, uh, the hardback of uh, Ivan Novello, My Life and In Search of Ruritania. So if anybody's interested in that, that's available as well. I'll I'll put links in the show notes um, so yeah. anyone that okay. wants to, to look at find those, then they can do. And it talks about Gossard Park and what went on as well in the novella biography I did. Yeah. Fantastic. So, and yeah. please, if, you, if you're listening and you want to watch a good movie this afternoon, yeah. watch that movie. You'll love it. Gossard Park. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank Thanks you so, so much, much David. All yeah, the best. No, and you too. Thank